Shall we start again, Vandana? Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, I mean, you brought in changes in your teacher education program and also systematically or systemically also in the uh, university, in your department. So, you would like to share some of the struggles that you, you had or, you know, you talked about working in groups, collaboration and the energy that gave you and the team some struggles that you had to face, if any? No, of course. <laughs> See, in a bigger system, uh, there would always be uh, disagreements. Mm -hmm. When disagreements are, uh, are, are kind of combined with hegemonic positions, they can be struggles for the other people, you know. So, we did face, um, I did face, uh, you know, disagreements and um, there is this idea, you know, that if somebody is coming in and if you are young and uh, I joined at the age of 27, when I was 27. So that's why I'm calling it young all the time, you know, otherwise, not otherwise. So, so there was this idea that you are over enthusiastic, you know, and then you're getting into too many places and probably you don't understand what working in the institution is like, you know, you're still putting yourself in a student's frame of reference where a student is doing 10 things at a time in a day. So this is not how a university professor is supposed to be working and stuff like that. So once there was those kind of, you know, sermons, which would often come from the seniors and the culture of that place in a sense. Culture of that place, yeah, yeah uh, you know, there is always this fear that probably the culture of the place will be, we have taken so long to establish a culture, you know, institutional ethos and somebody, generation. yeah, somebody dropping in will just spoil that up, you know, things like, uh, you know, there were things like you laugh too loudly. <laughs> I, I still don't know how do I control it because I do laugh very loudly, you know. And then you laugh with students. So when you laugh loudly, then you laugh with your students. And there was a point, you know, which were which kind of came up and and the kind uh, the way in which they came up, I think that was more problematic. And uh, in the beginning, I didn't know how to deal with these, you know, because. I never expected these kind of, I thought, you know, uh, I would be scrutinized for what I know, uh, kind of assignments I give in the classroom and those kind of stuff. I never thought I'd be scrutinized for the way I speak or laugh <laughs> or dress or, you know, things like that. And this laughter pass was an amazing one, you know, when somebody just came in and you saw the ex person said, no, I am. Happy. No, they should be happy to hear laughter in the class. Absolutely, and... absolutely. Recently, you know what happened is that uh, one of the colleagues came up and they said, "I was looking for you." I said, "How do you know I'm here?" I said, "I heard your laughter in the you know, in the department, and I thought Vandana is somewhere. You know, I got to go and locate this lady, which I just came back from my scholarship and all that. So, I mean." Now that it has become a part of your personality, it was a part of personality at that point also. But when you're talking about struggles, you know, struggles have been those minute kind of a thing, you know, that, you know, I remember uh, being an IDEC, uh, which we uh, had in 2018. And there was this boy who was saying, so I remember that Delhi University culture, you know, <laughs> he really used to make a lot of fun about that. He said, he wearing a tussle sari with a border and a shawl over here. <laughs> so, and if you don't do that, you probably, you don't look like, you know, those kind of things. So I didn't have a tussle sari to begin with and then, you know, work on with that. Uh, so, you know, you're scrutinized for what you're wearing, probably, you know. Uh, and things like that. So th those were the one kind of struggle, you know, which we had had. But when we come to the academic part of it, see, there were struggles in the sense that if you were trying to propose a course, it has to go through a system. Uh, the system of there is a there's a sequence of events. It will go to council, staff council, then you know, uh, then my committee of courses. I mean, there's a whole process, faculty of education, then it go to academic council, and then, because we are in a system again. So there were kind of resistance about whether this course could be allowed, you know, because there were, there were kind of scrutinies at different levels. But so that was one part of it. But the good part of it is the institutional practice by itself. The institution by itself has a lot of provision for people who want to launch a new course, 
who want to present a different perspective to a kind of thought which is being discussed in the classroom. So that practice came as a savior for people like me, you know, wherein I could just come up, I could say, I, I just don't want to talk about special education. I want to talk about diversity and education. I want to talk about inclusive education. So how from this whole idea of moving from special education to inclusive education, to diversity and inclusion, to diversity, inclusion and pedagogy. That has been a kind of, you know, uh, journey. Uh, we could do that because there are institutional provisions for us to launch new courses. That is, there, this kind of flexibility is there. There were struggles in the sense that different forums, uh, people don't like that you're thinking something different and you, you find that kind of a resistance. But if there was resistance, there was support also. That is how it could go through all the forums, you know. So I would not say that it was a smooth journey, but I would say that it was made possible because we had a rationale to do it. Like I had a rationale to do it, if I look at myself. And there were people who found, you know, who supported that rationale and they moved on. So probably, you know, it had to, it, it had those kind of uh, support systems where it went through, you know. And you don't really have to bend the rules hmm. to make things happen. Absolutely. You know? And nobody's stopping you to make those qualitative kind of change. Absolutely so. So I think the, um, uh, the resistance was more to the idea. And, uh, but then when we were able to justify it, yeah, when we were able to justify the idea, then there were less resistance and more curiosity that how you are going to bring this idea to to a hundred marks course now because you know ideas are like one-liners you know ek bar bol diya, one line it's it's done kind of a stuff so that was a curiosity that how would you convert an idea into a course and then to a practice and there i think the students came as as uh, as as the kind of representatives of how things unfold the kind of pedagogies that we hold in the classroom especially for emed and MPhil program. MPhil we have discontinued uh, from the UGC directors now. So MPhil is not done anymore. But before going for my fellowship, I did have an MPhil course to teach, which we are not continuing as a part of PhD coursework, which is different. So these students, they brought in a lot of energy into the classroom. And when we made the entire pedagogy to be experience based, when we were not giving them readings, like I was never giving them readings. And I often tell them that don't ask me for readings. I have this very specific uh, idea about readings, you know, because I always say that famous writers, your famous authors are those who have a great skill to write. They are able to write their narrative with continuity. They understand their readers very well. And so they kind of, you know, that is why more people buy them because they, they make it for more people. Like Stephen Hawking said that, when I was writing, when he was writing his book, he said that my my people told me that if you use one equation, your leadership will go by half, you know. So he said, I've used one equation is equal to mc square and I know my leadership is already half. So those kind of understanding your audience and your reader is also very important. Actually, and the problem for me with those kind of readings is that they are written so coherently that you immediately buy the idea. And you understand that if there is a problem which this author has tried to address, this is the best way to address that problem and your mind stops working there. It's all tied up neatly. That's right. Very convincingly, a very convincing narrative we drive out of our thought. And that is why it becomes a bestseller. So those kind of, that, it is because of that reason, you know, that in the initial phases of classroom discussions, when a new batch will come, for two, three months, I don't want them to read anything. I said, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, baat karte hai. And share their ideas, what is in there. Exactly. And especially the ideas of inclusion and having felt discriminated at any point of time or disadvantaged at any point of time is not new to any person. Everybody in their life would have had those kind of prepositions at one point or the other. Even in the family order. If you are a first child or a second uh -huh. child. Absolutely. <laughs> you are treated differently. You have a different mandate in the family. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so when they start talking about it, because see, why? And then, you know, somebody will ask that, why are you trying to do that? 
See, my idea is that if you want to practice inclusion, you have to understand your mindset. You have to redress, readdress your belief system. Because the exclusion is so deeply ingrained in the belief system that it just becomes a part of your thought. So if you don't start thinking about those minute things, everyday things in your life, you will not change. And discuss also, no? I mean, discussion yeah. is important. Yeah. Discussion is very important. So when people say a reflective teacher, I said, what do we want the teacher to reflect about? You know, a bit of physics comes in. That if you don't have a mirror, what will you reflect? How will you do? How will you study reflection? Right. So if you want to have that, you got to have an image to reflect upon. No. What are you reflecting upon? So let's start with self. If you are not good with self, you can start with somebody else also. Right. If you are not, if you want to talk about yourself, but you don't want to name it as you. You talk about this happened to somebody else. You don't have to identify yourself in the whole sequence. And this is what brings students to a discussion forum, where the idea is that you reflect upon your own belief systems. And the biggest challenge in this whole journey is how do you become non-judgmental? Because when, even when I'm, I'm talking about it, you know, and when the initial narratives will come, they'll come like, you know, so he did this or she did that or, or something like that. So the first kind of discussions that will come is where I identify myself as a disadvantaged person and I blame the people for my disadvantage. That my disadvantage is created because of their action. And then you have to convert that conversation to that your disadvantage is your feeling. When you start feeling disadvantaged, it's because you don't have resources to develop, uh, you don't have developed resources to respond to their action. So it's not about them, what they are doing. It's about how you respond to their reaction. And that is where it becomes important. And every time we have to say this, because, uh, and connected with the classroom situation. And the courage to be themselves. Precisely. And that is where the whole core value of rootedness and you know that, that kind of pride in your own self. Most of the people are not able to sustain in a system because they think that you know my, my, I'm, I'm not worthy of it. I may be questioned. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. You know, but then you gradually understand that, that you don't have to be good. You just have to be consistent. And do what you are. Absolutely. You f feel like doing. Absolutely, sir. So I recently had this research scholar who came up and uh, uh, said that uh, I, I, I can foresee problem in my research. She's a PhD scholar. I said, what is your problem that you foresee? She said, I think I don't write well. Okay, I think I get into grammatical errors. I think I don't know the language very well. So I said, you're done. She said, what do you mean? And she, and she said, first of all, she said, that is that you really oversimplify things, you know, it's a genuine problem. I said, I agree with you that it's a genuine problem. You're going to be writing something like 250, 300 pages. It is a genuine problem. But do you even understand that you have understood the problem? Now, at least you can work upon it. There is time for you to write your thesis. Now, find out how will you develop the skill of writing. And then also understand how an academic writing is different from creative writing and, and you know, writing an assignment. So if you think that you've had certain issues, you need to learn that skill of converting your thoughts into language and then understand that how do I make my language proper. So, you know, these are the kind of nuances, very small things which students struggle with. And if they don't have somebody who can come who they can come and talk about, they get in a, in a preposition, stuck. they get stuck, um, they get non-responsive because they're not sure about their writing. But if somebody tells me or if I, whenever I get my scholars and I tell them, I know you don't know how to write. And there are senior scholars, they're, they're teaching as college teachers, they're teaching in schools for long, there are English teachers who are teaching English. Even their dissertation writing is not great because academic writing is different than that kind of a writing. 
so you're not telling them that it's okay not to be perfect i think it's a job of a teacher yeah and there's a path ahead yeah, there's a path ahead. ahead so that's where you know things get a little different a little diverted and that's a kind of a pedagogy we are talking about be at ease with yourself and be at ease with with your students also and be at ease with your subject also you know these are the three things which are interacting in the classroom situation so these are another level of struggles that we have when we deal on a regular basis with students uh, they are all coming after graduation and technically after graduation they could have become an ias person or like they could have become a bank officer they could have become anything and they are coming for a teachers job and when they find those kind of inadequacies we need to be very candid with them and tell them that this is what has this is what happens we I'm, many a number of times i take them to my classrooms that when i wo- i went as an intern this happened when i taught in the school for four years this is how my first year happened second year happened so they understand that the growth is organic that the, you know you are not there because you were the best you are doing okay because you are learning every day and yeah so that helps you know you mentioned idec okay. the international democratic education yeah. conference yes yeah. uh what did uh, you came there with your scholars and research scholars what did the group get from there in a sense what uh, and what i know what you contributed you brought the whole thing alive but uh, how, what is what was your take away and the group's take away i think uh, if i talk about me and all other eight people who were there one of the greatest take away was an very deeply rooted faith in children you know we all talk about children's child center and child children be, are important children construct their own knowledge but that was one of the forums which grounded us grounded our faith in children you know because we saw children in the in that in that environment behaving very differently like just after the inauguration i was standing with some two three people over there and this girl just walks in i think she was in grade 7 or 8 and she says so i'm so and so what's your name all right so this was amazing right otherwise um, so i don't say the children are not like that but what i'm saying is our experience with children was revisited during that conference so if you ask me about the greatest contribution that's where i locate myself and i think most of the people uh, who are from the group uh, were, would locate their their kind of thing over there you know we also learned that um a uh, kind of a um, uh, conference you know what conference means in do <laughs> so a conference can have students as participants a conference can have different kind of stalls being put up you know where you remember we had put up those uh, stalks stalls with whirly painting and things like that and you know we also learned about that children may be encouraged to fund for their expenses this is one thing which is very immensely missing you know we we have big people big people money you know 20 plus 25 plus people fighting with their parents that you're not buying me this gadget why you're not doing this so at that that is i'm not saying that's a reality of the whole india but that is one of the multiple realities of a relationship of children with their parents i think that that thing that is where you know the responsibility and the pride which they they will take that okay i'm going to be selling this and i'm going to take out my expenses for the other things so you know it, it was kind of you know understanding economy in a different way that was not a profit making kind of a thing so the stalls were put up but it was not for the purpose of profit making like usually in delhi it's a very popular culture you'll put up stalls in all kind of fairs and you make uh, you make uh, profits out of that but that was sustainability that i'm i'm selling something i'm doing so work to sustain my expenses so i think these are the kind of things which were uh, not popular uh, with uh, at least with me i can say that for sure i would also like to say that they are still not popular so somewhere down the line 
this whole idea of taking responsibility of self is very important. Mm. For me also, I, at that time I remember talking to you how the children were looking at the program and going for attending right. different sessions, That's choosing. Right. That's right. Yeah. You know, the entire idea, the entire conference was so organic. And you know, the, uh, not only the, uh, the program which was put up, you know, it was like during the program, there's a chart where, you know, we have put the day's program, this thing there, this thing there. Then somebody will say, I want to do this also. So they'll just go and write it over there, you know, two to three, there is this activity also. So there was that openness that the kind of agenda for the day is not pre-decided. If something has come to your mind and you are like, let me just get me a venue. If there is no venue, I'll do it in the pandal, you know, or I'll do it in the gardens. That was a beautiful place where you can do And time was also luckily very good. The weather was very good that you could do it outside also. So those kind of impromptu kind of things, you know, that also made the whole thing very, very natural and very participative. And sometimes, you know, your research scholars also help to document, yeah. you know. That's, that's always there, you know, because um, uh, that was this idea of, you know, being present there and then contributing uh, to the whole, uh, the whole uh, system, to the whole uh, kind of event in a different manner. So, you know, whatever, whoever has can bring it on the table and they can say, okay, I can do this, I can do that. So, understanding volunteering, because that is another lost uh, kind of, a, you know, uh, tradition as what I will say that in my school time I, I remember we used to volunteer a lot of things you know um, but now that is a lost tradition people will say why are you volunteering you know and then there is this narrative somebody is using you because you are doing that kind of a thing and stuff like that uh, are they paying you up for this or not oh these people are making so much of money are they paying you and stuff like that so I don't know where that kind of a narrative has evolved where that kind of cohesiveness and collectiveness is missing in the entire event or things like that. But I don't know uh, after IDEC or even before that, uh, I've been, um, I've had a group of students, scholars who always contributed, who just came in and who realized that, you know, even when they're doing registration, it's a learning experience. So converting everything to a learning experience, something which is very basic, you know, even when you're looking at whether the uh, the lunch table is done properly, uh, coordinating the time with the mess, you know, even that is a learning experience. So that kind of open mindedness is what I think we have been able to create amongst people uh, through course discussions that, you know, every work has a worth and every small piece adds to the success of a bigger event or to make an even bigger, you know, all those kind of values we have been able to generate. And there are students who come back who yeah. kind of make yeah. those kind of contributions. Yeah. And I'm still in touch with many of those scholars. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which is nice. Yeah. You talked about rootedness. See, rootedness for me is uh, how an individual will ground. What is the, what is my core self, you know, like earth has a core, you know, and the mental and, and, the, and the upper surface. So. So what is the core value which I'm holding? That is one power of rootedness. And where are they coming from? What are the people I connect with? What are the scenarios I connect with? And how strong my connection is? You know, that, that for me is rootedness, you know. And I, I have a lot of faith in the idea that you have to be grounded to be able to expand and grow and flourish, you know. Uh, in the case of plants, it is their roots. So I think probably the word comes from there only. Uh, but rootedness is often, I think, in the recent times, it is confused being uh, with being um, non-static, uh, with being static, you know, that stagnant and static. You rooted means you're just being at one place and, and you're not, you're not trying to move around. So that is something which is a kind of a... Uh, point which I'm trying to, which I always try to make, you know, whenever I'm, I'm in those kind of conversations. So rootedness for me is uh, how I recognize idea of myself and uh, where do I belong to and what is my kind of, you know, how do I explain that to the world 
and how much of the self respect that identity has given to me i give to myself in fact you know so everybody has a kind of a profile that i come from here this is my place birthplace whatever 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 so we have a socio demographic profile of ourselves does that add to my self respect does that add to my self pride is something which i will call as rootedness mm. not only self no also uh, society or absolutely but why i am talking about self is because rootedness i am looking at in a individualized perspective that how i will call myself as rooted so when i say self esteem or self respect that is where i want to i really want to i want the people to introspect that are they happy with their own identity because this idea of tokenism if i say that i come from this 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 so the other person's reaction will be okay i already have a kind of a profile understanding about you you come from here you must be this you must be this you must be that you know those kind of stuff so that identity do i get baffled you know like this boy whom i talk spoke about you know this boy has come from rajasthan and and he just spoke in that yeah so th- he had a kind of a rootedness he that thing gave him a self respect he was not deterred by the people's response to his language and he knew that he had to focus on his idea that clarity that person had do more people have that kind of a clarity am i sure that i can be my regional self and 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 be very be very contented in an environment where that regionality or my identity is 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 in a less proportion if i am in a if i am in a kind of you know populous place where lot of people are like me with my identity it's a different the struggle is different but the moment i come to a forum where the uh, the place is more diverse people have dropped in from different places then what happens to my identity and my my own self that is where i brought in that idea of self yeah because and also your rooted the self is important yeah but that rootedness also is in a context absolutely yeah. absolutely so and that is why i am saying that i come to, with a socio uh, socio demographic profile that context of mine do i take pride in that or do i think that i have to change my practices i have to say certain words and not they say certain words because i have moved to a diverse context and this diverse context probably requires me to behave in a certain manner to become like a melting pot right in a, become melting pot rather than a collage absolutely yeah. so and i think that is a skill which people need to know and especially in this point of time when we talk about the local context and the global context it's 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 a very uh, unstabilizing kind of a preposition for a person to understand for an individual to understand also the difficulty is that uh, one wants to think of this if you have this you can't be that right or if you are that you can't be this but That's there's true. a simultaneity to it no Absolutely. it can be this and that not this yeah. or that that's right absolutely so so there could be a professional requirement if i enter into some kind of work do i leave my personal identity behind and let the work camouflage me and start doing it like that or do i go to the work with the skills thinking skills the process skills which are required for the work but i go as myself i don't feel that burden of uh, you know changing myself for that particular place it's something which is very very critical for me to understand you know because that is where this whole idea of acculturation comes in that is where this whole idea of you know um, whether i belong to my culture or i don't belong to that culture uh when i went on my fellowship i realized that people love indian dresses i mean like you know uh, they love indian food they love indian people they love hindi language because it's more popular i'm not trying to say that there is another reason but it, there is more popular so they try, they want to know they they want to know about bollywood songs and yeah because it's more popular i'm not trying to say that within india we only promote that no so it, that that's more popular they love it they want to know it they want to dance they want to celebrate holi they want to celebrate diwali they understand that i'm not saying that they don't want to celebrate eid like you know these are the kind of conflicting ideas that drop in when you start conversing in a particular manner so probably you know 
they know Eid more in context of you know Arabic countries or things like that. So when one of our fellow Fulbrighter was from Egypt, we celebrated Eid together, we had those kind of things together. But when it comes to India, this is the kind of you know depiction they have and they want to talk about. Maybe other part of India, they will have uh, other things also you know or other part of USA, they might know about other things also. I am not trying to contest Pungal, that. Pungal, uh, ha, that's right because there are a lot of communities who are living uh, there, expat communities, they celebrate festivals and, and people love that. F fundamentally, I think what they love about India is the idea of lot of colors you know and then a lot of celebrations, lot of light and then you know these are the kind of things. But so. Outside the world, the world is looking at us in a very positive manner. What happens to us when we come back to India? You know, when I come back to India, I say if somebody coming in and not speaking good, leave apart English. I'm talking about the North Belt because that's where I've lived most of my life. If somebody is not able to speak Hindi properly, we start laughing. So there's a kind of there's a kind of arrogance with regard to I know this, you don't know that. All right. I think we need to work on that arrogance. Even we are living in a country like India, we are so diverse. What is this arrogance all about that? Oh, you know, I speak Sanskritized Hindi and you can't speak that. I speak a good English, you can't speak that. Mm. Swach Hindi. Swach Hindi. I don't know if that's even a term. <laughs> that's a term. <laughs> must be, must be. So, you know, these are the kind of um, places, you know, where we got to work on people, we got to work with people and we got to tell them it's okay, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. People come from different, actually, you know, it's very interesting that if somebody comes from a foreign country and they speak their own language, we are like, wow. And if somebody comes from North India to South of India or South of India to North of India or, or any other place, you know, any part of India, and they speak a different language than that region, we are like, what? You don't know a language which everybody understands? This is, this is so crazy. I don't understand this. I tell you a very interesting episode on to this, you know. So I was working with this group of children, three children, and this is recent before I went, you know. And they were given some project to work on in a digital medium or something like that. So they would, we just got into language conversation, very interesting kids, you know, and we just got into this very interesting conversation and um, uh, they were like, we started talking about this, if the children, they were like, they, they were actually brainstorming on an idea which they can take ahead. So these children were like, what do we do, what do we do? And then I was like, you know, there were children, do you have people coming in, language came in as a part of diversity and then they were like, okay. And uh, they were like, okay, oh, yeah, we can do something on language. So I said, when people migrate from one place to another, probably they don't know English language. So what will you do? These are all children who are studying in a private school. So they don't understand somebody who doesn't know English. Mm -hmm. Then if somebody might drop into your school who doesn't know English, then what do we what know? What age group? Uh, grade 8. Uh, all of them, grade 7 and 8. Like they were just moving on to that. Now they are in grade 9. So these kids are like, okay. And you know, this guy just said that, and did you know about one thing, we have those kind of conference speakers, you know, headphones. And I go, yeah. So he said, you know, there are frequencies in it. And if you set it on one frequency, they, it's the, the, whatever is happening, they start translating it in that language, whichever the language the person. So there is a language which is set towards a particular frequency. So I, if you want to listen to any other language, you can set that up in that language and you can just go ahead with that. I said, yeah, I know, because I've attended a couple of conferences where this thing was available. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, why are we not using it in the schools? And, you know, coming from a grade 7 child, I think it was an amazing thing to think about. And I don't think if we have places which are unresourced, but we don't think about resources in a manner that we resolve a problem. We think about creating more resources for bringing in some narratives from out of context places and we say if it has worked in that context, it will work in our context also. But there are such kind of solutions which from experiential learning, they will move over to this kind of a thing and then you know that, that, that could happen, that could really happen. 
and i think that was one idea which struck with me for long i mean still with me finally these children created a, a kind of a app grade 8 okay now they are in grade 8 and now they are in 9 but this is between 8 and 9 they created an app where they have listed uh, they they wanted they were given a task to visit one of the inclusive institutions so they again approached me that how can we do that i said uh, you visit Amar Jyoti is a great place for you to understand, you will understand, you know, for a beginner that's a very good place to go. Okay, so they went to that place and they did that, they did that and then I went off, I didn't know what they did. They came up with an app where they started consolidating resources for parents. He said this, if when people will start understand, when they approach this, they will understand what are the authentic resources for them, if there is a child with special need in the family or things like that. And they just did that, it was a very small app they created and they sent me that, you know, prototype and we had a lot of discussion on that, I said just, just make it big, people need this. We can use it. Yeah, we, everybody can use it, that's what. So, you know, children have that potential to create a problem, uh, in, to look at a different, to look at a problem in a different perspective and come up with a different kind of a solution to it. Are we giving those kind of, you know, opportunities to children? Do we even look up at children as problem solvers? Mm -hmm. yeah. And That's constructors. Constructors. Absolutely. Yeah. Shall we look at uh, the aims and of education? Huh. What are we, <laughs> what are we here for? <laughs> So when we talk about aims, that is a very, again, you know, a very diverse kind of a uh, kind of a perspective because aims of education can be different in different contexts, right? But I would like to say that what should be the what could be the purpose, purpose. of education, you know? And purpose of education should have both the dimensions preparing me for a livelihood but also you know preparing me as a person evolve helping me evolve as a person so both these purpose should be there i think from a long time we often caught macaulay minutes and those kind of things from where where education has been used as creating you know certain workforce kind of a thing so, which I think is important, we are not saying that we should not prepare people, education should not prepare people for a uh, different kind of uh, uh, work or professions, whatever we want to call it. But I also think that education should give me that ground, kind of groundedness, again I want to use the word that, how I see myself in this world to be and uh, how reflecting am I, you know, if I have resources, can I be rude? If I don't have resources, do I always have to be humble? You know, there are these kind of connections which are made and the connections which are reinforced in the classroom, reinforced through the textbooks, you know, that a certain people will have to behave in a certain manner. Can we just kind of, you know, uh, merge those boundaries, blur, or I want to say merge till we are able to do away with them, you know, kind of a thing. So, those kind of interconnectivity with people, how I connect myself to other people, what are the kind of opportunities which I give to other people to connect with myself, I think those are the kind of very interesting episodes that we need to, that should be the purpose of schooling also. I am specifically talking about schooling, you know that uh, you know uh, we've often seen uh, in primary schools the children just play with each other mm -hmm. they are they are not they're very non-selective they're very inclusive is the word i can use you know they don't consider we go to even younger age they don't even consider gender yeah. you know girls and boys playing together there is no everybody who's from a sector they're all playing together and they're just working on to that as they grow in school system only they start you know uh, creating cliques of similar types. So, this identify with that, that identify with that, where the girls and boys can work with each other. Do we have people with different 
gender identities in the school? How do we respond to if there are people with different gender identities in the school? How do we have we learned the life skill to be with each other even with different mm. gender identities? So and variety as such in the school. Absolutely. Of, of any kind. You know? Absolutely. Maybe language, maybe gender, maybe you know, social, socio-economic. Absolutely so. Absolutely so. So that should also be one of the purpose of you know education when we talk about the purpose of education. I have this very uh, you know uh, if I'm saying it now this will not be a very what do you say regular question because people already know what they have to say. But whenever the students come to my classroom or I go to some place and I am like okay what do you see school as and what is the age group which is present in the school. So most people will say okay what is the school like. So. Uh, you know the early childhood was not there earlier so I was saying okay the school is from grade 1 to grade 12 now what are the age groups you see in the school and they say ma'am 6 to 18 okay so that focus when it comes to school there's a 6 to 18 I said no 6 to 60 how do you forget teachers the work staff the other people in the school you can't forget them all so when you go to a school you have that intergenerational interaction how are we not able to inculcate those intergenerational uh, respectful modes of communication with each other school is a great place to do that so it's not about the diversity amongst the students it's also about diversity in the school with different regard with the adults also the intergenerational that that age-based arrogance which comes in people whether it is the new age kids who say that you know the older people don't know anything or it is the older people who say that new people don't know anything but that's a great place five hours six hours you are together with each other let's let's learn to communicate that communication is missing another hierarchy which a school can break is the hierarchy of subjects how do we say that a you know that a science teacher or a science student is here science commerce and arts how do we create those kind of yes. conjectures i i don't understand that also now preschool primary elementary absolutely. why should a high school teacher be paid more absolutely <laughs> yeah. absolutely so yeah. so i think some of these things have been attempted in nep 2020 with the policy document and the national mentor mission npsg uh, you know the national professional standard for teachers and things like that so they're looking up a growth in verticals also and PST is proposing a vertical growth also because education is organized differently now and if we are able to kind of implement it properly we might have a different kind of system in years to come where these you know the, 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 the horizontal hierarchies will be addressed and I'll be very proud to say that I'm a primary teacher and you know those kind of things so that is what I meant you know coming back to the idea of rootedness I have a I have a personal identity, I have a social identity, I have a professional identity. Am I able to kind of, you know, weave a thread across all of them and, and evolve as a, as a human being? That is something which, which has to, I think, which is the need of the, which is the, the task of the school education. Yeah. And for you to prepare the teachers for that. Absolutely so, yeah. absolutely yeah. so, absolutely so. Okay. Yeah. We'll stop here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs>